back. Or, uh, good evening. Welcome to Stefano Boeri. Uh, multiplicity is the title of the lecture, and multiplicity is uh, the actually international research group uh, which researches the contemporary metropolis. It was actually during the so-called Hans Hollein Biennale in Venice when Stefano presented his research uh, to the, let's call that, the wider audience of architects, critics, and students. And that was actually a reason uh, when the Berla Institute invites uh, Stefano for our research uh, design exercise in, in Tokyo in 1999. Uh, since then, uh, we've been in almost constant, uh, direct and indirect relation with uh, the research which Stefano is conducting, uh, especially many of our students uh, contributed to his uh, show Mutations, which was in Bordeaux, and which is opening actually tomorrow in Brussels, and which will be presented in Tokyo. So there is somehow a very strong relation between uh, Stefano Boeri research and the research which we are trying to do at the Berla Institute. Bart Lotzma, one of our thesis tutors, is inviting Stefano Boeri for the, let's say, continuation of these uh, uh, relations in a next term uh, research on, uh, upon the Dutch conditions. So Stefano is going to talk today about his research. Uh, the presentation is technologically speaking, rather complicated. Uh, but um, what uh, we would like uh, to see, or what we hope to discuss, are actually the ways, the methods uh, uh, to <coughs> uncover the increase, increasing complexities of the contemporary urban situations. Uh, this is perhaps the assumption that if we are able to read the urban, suburban environments in a proper way or in a way in which they will unveil or uncover their complexities, then we would be better equipped uh, to intervene in these uh, situations as well. Uh, Stefano uh, published actually three books uh, with uh, his collaborators. First one discussing uh, Regione Milanese, or actually uh, uh, the, the, the suburbia around the city of Milan. Uh, that was in 1993. The second one uh, was uh, Cross Sections of a Country, uh, which was uh, actually produced uh, with uh, the photogra photographer Basilico. And the final one, which all of you would, would, would know, or maybe all of you would have on your bookshelves, is, of course, Mutations with uh, Rem Kohlhaas, Sandy Quinter, Hans Ulrich uh, Obrist. And uh, that would be basically uh, the kind of uh, invitation in which we would really like to see this lecture as only one uh, kind of uh, element in a continuous story of urban research, which we really do believe uh, constitute actually the core uh, activity at the Berla Institute as well. So Stefano, once again, we are really uh, indeed uh, happy that you are with us and we are really looking forward for not only for a lecture and a debate after lecture, but uh, very much uh, for uh, actually your new studio uh, uh, assignment here at the Bella. Thanks a lot. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. It's okay. Uh, so, first of all, I have really to thank Vedran, and I have to thank uh, generally the Berlag Institute, uh, not simply because they have invited me tonight for this lecture, but really for all the uh, materials uh, and the results of research that have been done in Berlag Institute in the last year that I have used in my in my research. I've used it together with this bunch of uh, European researchers we've called the multiplicity. So really, I, I hope that this uh, connection uh, Berlag with multiplicity will will uh, continue in the in the in the next future. And I'm glad to be here. 
it's possible to switch off the light, please? So I decided to, to speak in English. My English is very bad, but in any case, I think it's, it's better to entertain you with a, a bad spoken English than to bore you or teaser you with a, a maybe better written English. And I'd like to start simply uh, telling that uh, there is a, there is a, a sort of, uh, of uh, K entry in this lecture. Uh, or better, there is something, there is a notion that I'll, I will uh, continue to evoke uh, during this lecture, and it's the notion of stratification. So I like to propose you four different possibilities to enter within the notion of stratification. And the first one is connected with the, uh, with the notion of stratification in terms of knowledge. Why? Well, really, because I think that if in, in the field of urban studies, when we, when we try to, to deal with our, let me say, disciplines, we uh, have to consider that urban studies are a heterogeneous bunch of uh, different things. Practices, uh, research, uh, text, uh, expositions, and I really think that we have to uh, consider that uh, in the field of our study, there is a very weak capacity to uh, develop a really uh, capacity to accumulate ideas. I think that the history of uh, urban studies uh, is really a history of uh, continuous amnesis and, uh, let me say, sometimes uh, rediscovers. But uh, our disciplines, and I think in certain sense this is a paradox, compared with the object of our observation, which is, as we know, exactly the uh, physical and material demonstration of what is stratification. In terms of evolution of thought, in terms of evolution of ideas, urban studies are what is is incredibly far from an idea of accumulation of thoughts, accumulation of research, accumulation of ideas. Maybe this is the reason, this is for this reason, that in the last decades, I really think that uh, uh, expositions, architectural exposition and contemporary art exposition, have played a very interesting role within the, uh, let me say, the capacity of urban study to produce a thought which has a certain uh, a cumulative uh, um, dimension. And I think that we have really to take care of how the, some of the most interesting uh, uh, architectural and uh, contemporary art exposition produced in Europe in the last decades have played a very important role in the evolution of theories in the field of urban studies. I think that maybe why we can, we can personally, I consider uh, the, the one of the most important or the starting point of this short history of connection between exposition and uh, uh, the research on the, on the city uh, with the Biennale of Dennis uh, curated by Paolo Portoghesi in 1980. Uh, maybe you remember in that case the idea of Portoghesi was to ask 20 architects coming from around the world to realize a facade, simply one-to-one -one facade, and uh, 10 facades for which side of the uh, the huge building of the Corderia in the Arsenal of Dennis. And the idea is to write a sort of uh, street. Uh, in a certain sense, it was an attempt to, to, to underline the uh, absolutely uh, strong presence of historical uh, European city in the discussion of uh, contemporary architecture at the time. And uh, what I, th I think was really incredibly interesting in that exhibition was not exactly the, concept, the contents, maybe, of that uh, message, and, but the fact that using a material uh, presence of uh, uh, an installation, Paolo Portoghesi was able really to transmit 
the concrete uh, starting point of a big uh, shakeup in the evolution of uh, disciplines of architecture and urban study. I think that the Biennale in Venice in 1980 was really the starting point of uh, the postmodernism wave. And uh, it was a starting point exactly because it was able to uh, materially demonstrate in the space of the exhibition, so to give us a really a sensorial uh, appreciation to the public and to the visitor of what was, could be an architecture able to, uh, uh, let me say, recuperate and to use material coming from the European history. So but that's, that's one what probably the starting point of this short history. I think that some years uh, later, we are in uh, 1885, in Centre uh, Pompidou, uh, in Beaubourg, in Beaubourg, a Canadian, uh, uh, or a better French philosopher, uh, uh, François Lyotard, proposed a completely different uh, exhibition, installation. The title exhibition was uh, Les Immatériaux, and uh, I think that that was probably uh, another incredibly important step. Step, sorry, in, t in the sense that uh, uh, Portuguese started uh, with an exhibition uh, directly connected with the theme of the historical tissue of European city, and Lyotard, five years before, coming from a completely different uh, field of uh, knowledge. Uh, proposed an exhibition, an installation, was very sophisticated in terms of technologies used in the installation itself, which was observing, let me say, the suburban environments. What he done there, it was simply, it was an empty space. He used uh, one floor of Bobourg, and uh, uh, simply the visitor was called to use uh, earphones, and uh, running, walking in this uh, empty space, they had the, uh, the possibilities to uh, synchronize with different sound uh, sources. And the idea was, in that case, to represent with a sensorial experience uh, the uh, ground back noises which, uh, in a certain sense, surround us when we uh, used to cross with a car a suburban environment. So this. Uh, uh, incredible molecular multitude of different buildings uh, agglutinated and uh, in a certain sense uh, uh, surrounding us which produce a sort of uh, uh, basso continuo which continuously uh, change and uh, without the, 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 the perception to be within a specific part of the city but uh, with the idea to, to, to across uh, 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 diffuse and uh, not uh, design a tissue which uh, apparently uh, is maybe it will never finish. So this is maybe the second step. I really consider the research done in that case by François Lyotard an incredibly interesting research. And I think that maybe the first step for me was the uh, incredibly and uh, for me really uh, fascinating experience and the uh, exhibition made by Catherine David and Jean-Francois Chevre in Castle in, uh, uh, 1996. Uh, Documenta 10 was for me really maybe one of the higher point of the uh, research on urban uh, phenomena. Uh, what happened in, uh, in Castle in that year was really interesting. And uh, I think that exhibition was, in a certain sense, uh, misunderstood. For instance, was misunderstood completely from the art critics that were uh, completely fascinated by what happened at some kilometers uh, far from uh, Castle in Münster, where in the, the same days were opened, was opened a very edulcorate and a very academic uh, exhibition uh, about public space with all the public art in the public square, in the square, and so on. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in, in Castle, artists were called to produce uh, things within the public space in the terms that they were producing, using their work as a sort of vibration in the perception of ordinary urban environment. We were working in the city, in Castle, and at a certain point suddenly we were disturbed by the presence of a, 
uh, at an advertising billboard that were done by, for instance, Jeff Wall. We were walking within the street, and at a certain point, we were disturbed by the fact that the, in the video, in a, in a, in a in a glass of a shop, what there is a, a, a video made by Dan Graham, for instance, but was uh, always a, a something which produced a small vibration in the ordinary perception of the ordinary urban environment. So I think that in that case, what for me was really incredibly interesting was this uh, idea to, to, to continue work about the notion of ordinary. Uh, some years ago, uh, I mean, in 80, the fire is here, okay, uh, in uh, 1998, I think there is a, we can, we can found another contribute to this short history, and it's a contribute uh, produced by two young art critics, uh, Hans Ulrich Hobrist and Hu Haru. And Cities on the Move is, an, as probably you have, you have, many of you have seen this exhibition because he has, uh, what was interesting in this case was uh, the idea of a sort of mobile exhibition. It started in, in, uh, in Vienna, then uh, he, it went in, in, uh, in New York at PS1, then in, in London, uh, then uh, in, in, uh, in the southeast of, uh, in, uh, in Korea. Uh, and the idea was, in that case, to uh, not simply demonstrate how the model of the Asiatic city is a model which is able to penetrate in the uh, contemporary European urban tissue, but was also the idea to show how a mobile uh, group of researchers, because this, this exhibition was made by uh, artists and architects too, uh, is able to, uh, let me say, to use an exhibition as a research. It really, Citizens of the Move was a research more than an exhibition itself. It was a way to go ahead in the certain themes connected with the research on urban studies. In that case, the theme was the um, uh, southeast metropoli metropolitan uh, areas and, its, and their incredible growth in the last years. But in any case, it was interesting to really to note as this research made by uh, meetings uh, connected with the opening exhibition were always a way to go ahead to encounter to a large the bunch of researchers who were involved from the, from the beginning. And uh, maybe uh, I really like to finish this first part of, the, of my lecture connected with the idea of stratification in terms of knowledge. With an, another case that for me is incredibly interesting. It is a case of uh, a, an exhibition uh, planned and organized by Giancarlo De Carlo. Giancarlo De Carlo is an Italian architect. He was one of the founder of Team 10 group in the 60s. And in the 68s, uh, he has organized for the Triennale of Milan a large exhibition dedicated to the theme of the big number. This is what the theme, the title of the exhibition. Uh, I think that really that was uh, an incredibly interesting exhibition. He, he uh, in a certain sense, he, he, he anticipated uh, a point of view about the contemporary urban environment uh, using the notion of big number has in the same way that we are nowadays using the notion of multitude when we try to describe uh, the multiple uh, point of view which across the contemporary urban environment and when we try to describe also the uh, complicate decisional systems and the multitude of subjects that nowadays in our cities are able to change the physical environment and to be part of a decision connected with the change in the physical environment. So this notion of big number was at that time incredibly uh, anticipating a little bit what happened now and also was incredibly interesting because we were in 68. We were in a moment that where uh, student movements started to, to have to play a, a strong role. 
in the field of, in, in, in the political life of uh, many of the most of European, uh, European cities. And for this uh, exhibition, Giancarlo De Carlo called uh, some incredibly interesting uh, people, like for instance, uh, Saul Bass, who did an, uh, a fantastic installation about the idea of, uh, of uh, creativity, which is a, a scaffold where englobed the creativity. Then he is called Stockhausen, and uh, for instance, uh, Georgi Kippes. Georgi Kippes was at that time one of the most interesting uh, researchers in the field of perception, of visual perception. Uh, um, Kippes proposed a, a fantastic installation about the perception of the, night, the nightly perception of the city. And uh, many interesting architects, like, for instance, Cedric Price and uh, uh, Peter Smithson, and of course, uh, his friend uh, Aldo van Eyck. What's happened? Happened that the exhibition was never seen. Uh, the day of the opening, this is uh, for me uh, one of the most fantastic pictures I've ever seen, uh, a group of students and of uh, artists, you, you can see here Giancarlo De Carlo, this is here, and the face is telling everything. Uh, here we are exactly uh, the day of the opening, the hour before the opening. The students arrived and they uh, asked, on a certain day, occupied the Triennale. And they uh, occupied the Triennale and they decided to, to, simply because there was, uh, uh, the idea was to uh, let me, to, to, to demonstrate the, uh, their capacity to stop uh, the life of a public institution, that was, of course, in these in this years. And uh, without any uh, awareness that the exhibition was, in a certain sense, trying to enter in a discussion, in a debate, with, that was incredibly close to the themes uh, observed by the movement, student movement in these months. Uh, they decide to occupy, and really, in 10 days of occupation, the students have destroyed completely the exhibition, destroyed everything. But what's happened? That this exhibition is a sort of a ghost event. Really, nobody has seen it, because also the students arriving there have started to destroy them. And, uh, 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 but, uh, like in a really incredibly paradoxical way, uh, what's happened with this uh, uh, exhibition is that uh, this uh, exhibition, is, as for me, uh, has started to work uh, in a very strange way, in, in the sense that uh, you know very well what happened when books, uh, with some rare books that we know without having read them, simply because we are surrounded by comments, we are surrounded by rumors, we are surrounded by, by critics, uh, that really, in a certain sense, uh, uh, make us enter in the contents of the book uh, without having read it. What's happening with this exhibition is that this exhibition is coming to be, in the last year, more and more and more and more important. And uh, I really uh, had the, the experience to, 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 to encounter, to meet the themes of the exhibition, but not simply the themes. Also the proposals made by the artists and the architects invited in different parts of the world, always when we speak about contemporary urban condition nowadays, I think that more and more we encounter the silent presence of this uh, unseen and ghost, uh, and ghost event. So uh, simply to arrive to maybe uh, uh, one exhibition that I really cannot put in this list for, for many reasons. The first one is that really is so close to our recent experience and that we cannot really verify the effects, the result of the the mutation exhibition that was, as you know, opened in Bordeaux uh, last year. Uh, but in any case, I'm sure that mutation was an attempt, was really an attempt to, uh, let me see, inscribe, uh, uh, to describe itself in, within this uh, short history of exhibition. What can we say nowadays about, about this mutation, about mutation? But I think that what we can say is more or less simply that 
Uh, mutation has played an interesting role uh, in terms of uh, criticizing the notion of globalization. For me, really, this is probably the unique, really interesting reason, and the, really the, the profound meaning and content of the mutation exhibition. Uh, I like to, to be clear about this, because I think there is something there incredibly important. I think that uh, we are, in a certain sense, entering in another part of the lecture, where I will use the notion of stratification in a different way, in this case, I, I really like to propose you uh, uh, the, the radical opposition that I see between the notion of globalization and the notion of stratification. I think that uh, globalization is a notion as it is used usually by researchers in, uh, in the field of contemporary of urban studies is really used with, uh, in a way that is really incredibly far from the notion of certification. And what I really like in, in, in the contribute uh, um, uh, um, gathered in this exhibition is that in a certain sense they are all, all uh, determined to criticize or better to ignore the notion of globalization. I think that the globalization is nowadays really a rhetoric in the discourse, in the field of, uh, of um, architectural and uh, <laughs> urbanist debate. And uh, what I uh, really like to underline is that uh, this rhetoric is, uh, uh, is, is playing a, a very uh, strong and uh, regressive role in, in, uh, in our fields. Also, and, uh, also when, but more, uh, more than also, when exactly this rhetoric tries to uh, spatialize the notion of globalization. So we have read in the last years many texts. Uh, I, I, I simply give you one name because I think it's the name of a person that in a certain sense I, I really respect in terms of uh, quality of some research that he has done, which is the name of Saskia Sassen. I think the Saskia Sassen has produced several texts, several books connected with the idea of globalization, with always the attempt to spatialize, to give uh, physical support to uh, the theories connected with the idea of globalization. But I think, really, that always this kind of use of the notion of globalization, it's really uh, in a hypocrite way. Because always, in this case, the attempt is simply to project on the physical environment an amount of data, an amount of uh, knowledges, which are completely abstract. So it's in a certain sense, the idea to consider physical space has a, a neutral uh, uh, screen, where more or less we can project uh, consideration and things and thoughts that are uh, developed in a field which are, in a certain sense, considered as completely abstract. Uh, I think that many of the Saskia Sassen books has this kind of uh, uh, quality or the kind of nature. And in this sense, I think that mutation, uh, in a certain sense, has tried to play a completely different role. Why? Because. Uh, Mutation is trying, has tried, has started to, uh, not, I think, collecting researches that were uh, developed in, in these in this years in different parts of Europe. And I think that Berlage is an avant-garde on this uh, 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 work, uh, heterogeneous bunch of research that in Europe are nowadays uh, going on. Uh, what uh, Mutation has done was, first of all, started to, to bring the, the, the physical environment has primary field of observation. So in a certain sense, to completely uh, uh, change the point of view of the research, which tried simply to specialize uh, the globalization phenomena and the globalization processes. Then the idea of, of a mutation is really the idea that the environment, physical environment, is nowadays a metaphor of uh, uh, urban life is a metaphor of urban society. And this is exactly the reason for which we have to go to enter 
to get close to the uh, urban and physical environment using the physical environment with a uh, indictory paradigm. So using uh, the traces and the clues that we can find the physical environment in order to know something more about what's happening in our urban societies, in, or, in order to know something more about what's changing in social behaviors in the space. I think that a third, a third uh, contribute that mutation has done, always in opposition to this, uh, let me say, uh, uh, edulcorate and easy uh, wave connected with the notion of uh, globalization, is the idea to uh, observe the physical change in our city while it changes. To, to really to decide that the uh, evolution in real time is what we have to observe nowadays. Because really, if we observe physical environment during the change, in uh, while it's changing, we can really uh, observe and consider and enter in a world of movement, of action, of tremors, that otherwise we, can, we are uh, obliged to last in, in the, in the more or less. And I think that this is very important for me, the idea to, uh, to, to develop, let me say, a, a research which is a contribute to the idea to a new discipline, which is not immediately uh, connected with architecture and is not immediately connected with uh, harmony. Ay, ay, ay. Saskia Sassen is coming. <laughs> but I think it's more or less connected with the real the possibility to develop a thought which is in between urbanism, architecture, landscape theories, and, uh, and larger group of research, which tried to use it to underline and to observe the physical environment as an extraordinary and rich field of suggestion connected with the knowledge of our urban societies. And then another, uh, for me, interesting um, contribute made by Mutation is the idea to, pro to propose a very weak relation between, uh, let me say, analysis or better observation or better readings on our contemporary urban city from one side, and on the other side, uh, design activities or project activities. Uh, I think this is, in a certain sense, uh, simply the uh, demonstration, the explicitation of uh, uh, an uncertainty. But we are within this uncertainty. I think we have learned, uh, also observing this history of exposition, we have learned the fact that nowadays we cannot uh, put in a deductive uh, way the, the relation between analysis and design in the field of architecture. Uh, but at the same time, we are uh, not, no longer uh, legitimate to say simply that when we do analysis, we are at the same time designing and projecting things. And when we, when we do a project, when we do a design, when you do a design here in Berlin, Eastern, for instance, you are always testing uh, your capacity to observe what is happening in the physical environment. I think that these two arguments are coming to be uh, weeks and weeks, week and week, more and more weak. Uh, what we can say is simply that probably uh, we have to englobe in ourselves an inclusive attitude, which is exactly the, the attitude which uh, uh, make us always to open the future, to consider more and more possibilities, to observe different processes and phenomena connected with the physical environment. Let me say to, be, to use urbanism as a part of our knowledge. And at the same time, we have to be uh, radically exclusive because our work as architects is a work that makes us to arrive to a decision. We have to close the future. We have to decide a, fo a shape, a form, a material configuration. So I think that simply we cannot uh, allow that one of these two uh, dimensions or one of the two spheres uh, uh, can be able to, to command, to, to be, to, um, uh, let me say, to win on the other. We have, I think, to host uh, the uh, radical contradiction that is absolutely true, is there, is within us. We have simply to, to have the, the irony also, to host this contradiction. That's the reason of, because 
usually architects are have very serious psychological troubles, I think so. But I think we have to admit that this is our condemn, or in a certain sense, is our way to be in this world. And for me, this is incredibly interesting. So I think that mutation in that direction has played a certain role. Uh, the idea of an exhibition promoted by architects where there were no design, no projects showed in the layout, in the installation, as you have probably, is a something which uh, uh, make us reflect about this condition of uh, uncertainty. And finally, and finally, uh, I think that maybe synthesizing of what I have done, I have told you about mutation. Uh, at the end, uh, simply I think that in mutation there is uh, something very, very weak maybe, but we, that we can develop. I think that this, this something, is, this, this concept is, is coming from uh, many other sources, research uh, institutions in Europe, like for instance, I repeat, Berlage. But there is something which uh, connected with the idea of space, which for me is very actual and very interesting. Uh, the idea of space as something which is connected with the notion of stratification, uh, but uh, not simply in terms of uh, capacity to project on the physical environment the representation of uh, uh, social and economical phenomena, by the idea of space like a, a, a place where we can really observe the stratification of, uh, uh, let me say, physical heritage, uh, so new social behaviors, and uh, cultural attitudes. So it's, uh, it's an attempt to, in a certain sense, to continue the steps that I have showed you, starting from probably Giancarlo De Carlos and Tim Tens, let me say, let Tim Tens exhibition in 68, and to go ahead with this idea of space as a sort of anthropological dimension. That I think is something that we have to take care of in these years. I have the, the, the feeling that something is really changing in the field of our weak disciplines. I really think that architecture is not a structured discipline. It's not, and urbanism too, I think they are completely, uh, they have a stat status which is really uh, ontologically weak in certain sense. Uh, I think what is happening nowadays is that uh, is coming, is, 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 uh, is, is emerging, I think, in the field of our weak uh, practices, weak research experiences, a network of point of views that uh, I think we cannot simply say they are, uh, they can be explained with the notion of interdisciplinarity. It's something that's completely different. What is interesting is that nowadays more and more uh, people coming from the field of contemporary art, people coming from the field of photography, people coming from, in the, from the discipline connected with geography or so, urban sociology, and people coming from, in, from the discipline connected with architecture are observing the same things. Never trying to mix their knowledges, maybe, or uh, avoiding the rhetoric of uh, interdisciplinarity in terms of changing and exchanging categories, but uh, always trying to, uh, let me say, uh, compare the different result of research developing in different fields, but always in presence of an object which is coming to be more and more common. And what is incredibly interesting for us as an architect is that we are really in the core of this uh, network, not because our history as architects legitimate us to be in the core. I don't think this. I think that architects in a architecture in a certain sense is something which is incredibly far from the point of view of the theories from this core. But we are in the core because we are professionally uh, the people we are closer to the change in physical environment. And we have the, the possibility, I think, in the next future to play an interesting role from this point of view. Uh, simply before entering the last, in the third part of the lecture and trying to arrive to the end, uh, I'd like to show you this. This is a maybe a unique uh, way in, in, in which globalization is for me nowadays uh, used in terms of uh, uh, special capacity to uh, specialize this concept. This is a, uh, an image 
taken by a, a text uh, of cyber geography. I think that cyber geography is one of the most interesting young disciplines. And what's interesting, for instance, this is an atlas done by two English researchers, Duge and Kitchen, is that uh, in this uh, research, we can observe, first of all, that the net, simply internet, uh, is not simply maybe the most evident effect of globalization, but this may be the cause, the reason, the most, the primary uh, source of uh, globalization, and this is in a certain sense uh, quite banal. But the second thing that I think we have to, we may observe uh, studying this atlas of images of contribute is that uh, uh, globalization is at the same time as we have, we have read uh, something which works with the paradox of uh, uh, extension, of connection, and with uh, an incredible uh, radicalization of uh, unbalances of equilibria. Uh, what I, I appreciate in this uh, research is that there is an attempt there not simply to specialize, but to, uh, let me say, to uh, develop an idea of uh, local space with may become more and more interesting. This is an image that I really like. Uh, it's a, a, a sort of, uh, uh, how do we say, a section of a daily uh, internet connection all over the world, uh, simply doing a, a added, as a skyscraper, the amount of contacts developed in some uh, places of the world. And what is interesting for me that, of course, we are in North, in North America. This is Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, San Diego, New York, uh, Boston, Chicago. This is Tokyo. And this is Europe. Uh, Europe is something which is incredibly homogeneous. So in this uh, description of, uh, of the of globalization has a process which produces incredible equilibria. Europe is will be an exception. It's an incredible exception. It's, it's a, an environment where uh, also the uh, internet networks are working, producing a, an environment really homogeneous, without peaks and without deserts, like it happens uh, in other regions of uh, other world. And I like to start for this consideration, I want to propose you, uh, in a short time, uh, some materials of, uh, of the research we have started to do uh, in occasion of the mutation exhibition in Bordeaux. Uh, the title of this research is, in a certain sense, explain more than what I can, I can try to, to tell you uh, tonight. We really started to develop and to develop this notion of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty not simply in terms of our capacity to uh, govern a theme so complex like the theme of uh, European identity, but uncertainty also because in a certain sense uncertainty is something which is uh, in a certain sense uh, uh, radically connected with the nature of Europe, with the nature of history, with the history itself uh, of, uh, of Europe. We tried, we started to, uh, in 1999, uh, to, to, to work with a large network of researchers, something like 70 researchers coming from 15 different countries. Many of the researchers were studying in the Berlager Institute in, in Amsterdam. And uh, the idea was uh, to uh, propose a view about contemporary urban Europe not starting from an attempt to uh, define Europe as a, uh, a continent, a geographical or geopolitical continent, which can be really designed in its perimeters. Uh, we had really the opposite uh, convention that uh, Europe has never been a perimeter uh, context, uh, and more uh, that Europe uh, can't be read as a geographical, geopolitical continent in terms of a defined uh, physical environment. The history of Europe has always been a, a history of, uh, of uh, mobile borders and of uh, continuous change of uh, uh, centers. Uh, it's a history who has continuous change in a certain sense, the physical, geographical dimension and nature of, um, of uh, Europe. Uh, the idea of the of our research was to try to find 
something which is connected with European identity, not starting from a topographical view, not starting from a, a zenithal view, but uh, starting uh, observing uh, local processes of change. And I can say starting to work with an idea of, uh, with the idea to, to catch, to, to, to collect uh, innovation processes. When I, when, I, when I speak about innovation, I, don't, I, I, I really, uh, uh, I really uh, need to clarify that for me, innovation is not simply change. When I, when I use the term innovation, I, I use these terms uh, in, the, in, the, in the meaning uh, that I used before when I was used the, the notion of space of, of, as a sort of a anthropological condition. So for me, innovation is something which really is able to constitute new relation among uh, social behaviors, physical heritage, and cultural attitudes in a certain sense, not simply a change which is produced uh, adding something uh, or moving uh, things in the space. And searching and trying to uh, detect innovation, we were immediately faced with uh, uh, the fact that innovation in Europe nowadays is not produced by, let me say, academic architecture. And with the fact that innovation nowadays in Europe is not produced by public policies, by planning activities, for instance. We can find situ condition, urban condition, really interesting from the point of view to invent new specialities, to invent new connection in the social behavior of people, more and more where this change is, uh, let me say, produced by self-organized processes. Uh, I don't mean exactly, I don't want to tell that it's, it's uh, what is changing in Europe and what is interesting in Europe is simply produced by spontaneous processes. No, it's not this the thing. The thing is that we can find places and spaces where Europe is changing and producing something new, uh, where uh, uh, the promoters and the users of this space are more or less the same people. Uh, what I like to say is that more and more in, in this in European uh, urban environment, the change is produced by a multitude of uh, individual tremors, a multitude of uh, decisions, a multitude of uh, point of view, and that, that this multitude of point of views arrive in a certain in certain cases to uh, establish some uh, sort of uh, horizontal. Uh, uh, liaison, horizontal uh, networks, horizontal relations, which are really, in a certain sense, uh, uh, can be compared with the model of self-organization. But I'd like to, to tell you something about this uh, later. Uh, OK, this is another thing that I have no time to show you. Uh, maybe what we can do is to see something about the video. The video is simply uh, an attempt to synthesize in some short time okay there's no sound so I can explain you what to do. Uh, here we are, for instance, in the time sign. In the, sorry, we are in time sign in uh, in uh, in um, in near Newcastle, in England. Who speaks is the is a miner, and uh, is a miner trying to explain how he is now reusing a vast uh, territory of uh, abandoned uh, coal uh, mines. Uh, thanks to a, a very spontaneous process of uh, uh, recolonization of this uh, huge environment, which has connected with the idea of uh, uh, leisure. Uh, if we go there in uh, this uh, really uh, uh, strange environment, because it's a, it's a flat natural environment which has been transformed by the presence of uh, Miner of, of mine of uh, coal miners, uh, uh, we can nowadays find an incredible amount uh, 
of uh, microinfrastructure connected with the leisure. Uh, I mean, uh, football fields, uh, small natural reserves, uh, uh, lakes for sports fishing, uh, uh, parachuting club or artificial ski slopes, and so on. And uh, in this case, really, what is interesting, this is incredibly bizarre and nice, also at the same time, I don't know what we can, can do about this, but is, <laughs> is that uh, maybe this, uh, which is a, really a, a, an attempt to recolonize an abandoned, huge environment, and which is a, 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 a phenomenon which is absolutely not controlled by the public uh, uh, authority, uh, is something which is really producing a radical change, it's fantastic, radical change in the history of this uh, huge environment. And is also in a certain sense something which obliges us to reflect about the fact that uh, not simply here, but we also in, in the rural area or in other uh, uh, abandoned uh, old industrial area in Europe, maybe the unique position, uh, uh, the unique way we have nowadays to reconquire and to reuse this huge environment is to, uh, let me say, facilitate this multitude of small and, uh, uh, let me say, self-organized attempt to reuse the space, more than to imagine to uh, trust in huge, unique projects, architectural, architectural projects. But observing this uh, case and uh, uh, showing you some other case, what I'd like to simply to tell you is that uh, I think that if we uh, are really trying to develop an idea of Europe, uh, not has, this is a, a diagram, uh, not another time I'd like also to, to, to have the time to, to discuss with you a little bit more about the different uh, techniques we used to represent this phenomenon, because this is one of the most difficult uh, questions we, we have to face as architects and urban uh, researchers when we have to represent uh, processes of change like this one. Uh, we, in a certain sense, multiplicity is a, a group, is a real in the sense of interdisciplinary groups, as uh, in a certain sense you are also here in Berlage. Uh, we are used to work with artists, with uh, photographers, we are used to work with yeah, parachutists <laughs> and filmmakers. And uh, it's always, uh, uh, let me say, the, the question of representation is always something which is uh, incredibly uh, present in our, in our attempt. Uh, uh, here we are in Burgat, uh, and this is a research that we have uh, done thanks to the help of uh, a group of uh, Berlage students, of Anna Zocchis and uh, yeah, Milica. Milica, sorry. And they have done, together with uh, Bart Lotzma and, and another, uh, an incredibly interesting research about uh, a phenomena which happened in Burgat after the embargo caused by the war. Uh, what's happened there that the, the, the structure of the, the traditional commercial uh, articulation uh, collapsed, of course, after the embargo. But at the same time, the collapse of the commercial art, uh, structure was substituted by a wave of uh, uh, mobile, uh, uh, small scale uh, vendors, let me say kiosks uh, and other suppers for mobile uh, uh, commerce, which has really invade uh, the public space of the city. I don't mean simply the streets or the square, but I really think the ground floor of the city, entering also in the uh, empty space uh, at the ground floor of the buildings. So also in this case, we are observing something which is in a certain sense self-organized, something which is really producing a new landscape, something that in Bergat we can observe as a, an extreme condition, but at the same time we can uh, absolutely, we know very well that we have the same experience, we, have, we can encounter, we can meet processes which are incredibly similar to this one also in uh, many other parts of our urban cities. So 
this idea of a hyper-fragmented uh, public space in which uh, commercial activities uh, play a more and more uh, a strong role is something which has really we have to, to study, to, to understand better. And uh, I think that also what is really, really interesting in the case, uh, in the case of Bergen is the, the, the decisional structure of this new attitude to to produce commercial place in the public space, to, to enlarge public space. Uh, both these two, these two examples, for instance, started to tell us something about what is Europe nowadays in terms of, uh, let me say, a special device, in terms of a local device of change. So we are not speaking about Europe as a geographical continent, but more as Europe has a really a local device of change. Uh, for instance, we, we can start to say that this very something which is absolutely specific of Europe is its capacity to accumulate, to stratificate uh, things. Uh, but not only. I think that observing this case study, we, are, we, we have understood uh, that another char character of Europe, uh, which is in a certain sense very new, uh, but it is still working in a very radical way. It's the incredible capacity that the urban device has to metabolize traditions and experiences and cultures uh, coming from abroad. So the capacity to englobe in the tissue of European urban environment parts, fragments, of experiences in terms also of architectural experiences, in terms of experiences of social behavior, uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, born in uh, different uh, parts of our, of our world. And I really think that this capacity to metabolize, in a certain sense, to reinterpret the uh, foreign condition is something which is really uh, extremely connected with the identity of Europe in terms of a local device of change, always. Not in terms of a capacity has a bunch of national states to take care or to have foreign policies. Absolutely not. We are starting to do it with a completely different uh, point of view. This is another research, another case study developed in Berlage Institute uh, by Carol Schmidt. Carol Schmidt is she's here, and she is one of the uh, author of uh, and the creator of Multiplicity. Uh, here we are in, in Benelux. Uh, I think we all, you all knew, you know not very well uh, what is Benelux uh, nowadays. But what we have observed in Benelux in, in specifically is this uh, strange uh, new uh, urban filaments or new uh, urban uh, linear uh, environment which are growth in the last decades uh, along the borders, the political borders. French to Belgium, Belgium to Holland, Holland to Luxembourg. You know the borders are nowadays quite anachronistic, as a really uh, a line of separation, but they still work in terms of uh, uh, define uh, different sphere from the, from in, the, in, the, in the sphere of fiscal, uh, for instance, uh, uh, conditioned or in the field of um, taxes and so on. So what's happening in, in Benelux in this uh, huge region is that more and more people coming for, uh, from the middle class uh, started to, to choose to live, to live, to inhabit the environment which are nearby the borders. Uh, and using the borders as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as a parasite. They are, in a certain sense, uh, really uh, parasite dwellings but, uh, and uh, trans um, parasite erratic uh, inhabitants that in their daily life they uh, spend an incredible part of this time uh, driving a car and crossing the borders. Uh, working in, in Belgium and uh, living in, uh, in Luxembourg or working in Holland and living in Belgium and so on. And uh, in a certain sense trying to, to use this uh, condition uh, for, many, uh, for many of their really egoistic uh, uh, reasons. Uh, but the effect of this process, which is uh, another, another way, a process which is in a certain sense uh, completely not uh, controlled, uh, completely not planned, 
is a, really the production of the new uh, dimension of the city. It's something that we can see in other parts of Europe. It's, a, it's not simply the notion of diffuse city, it's something more complicated because it's a city uh, which has inside a very specific DNA, a very specific genetic code, which is made by a multitude of different objects uh, in, a quite, in a certain sense uh, connected one to the other, uh, but which is very difficult to, de to, de to decipher the logic, the syntax of this tissue of this uh, city that we uh, are more and more able to perceive uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> with a sort of dynamic perception. Uh, one third characteristic maybe of uh, contemporary uh, urban uh, device in Europe is also, of course, as we have seen, uh, the incredible density of things and of people that inhabit and which is hosted in this uh, environment. So I think that these three things, this capacity to accumulate, uh, and the second, the capacity to metabolize what is coming from abroad, and the third character, this capacity to, to host, to tolerate a so radical density of things and of people, are in a certain sense, uh, in a, one of, uh, are working together, and working together, they start to tell us something or more precise about what use, is Europe uh, nowadays. And maybe we have to add another character, which is for me very important to uh, specify the identity of Europe which is this capacity uh, to, uh, let me say, to host uh, very complex uh, decisional systems. Europe is a city where decisions are taken by a multitude of people. And more and more it's, Europe is this one. And I think that Europe is uh, really nowadays, urban Europe is something which is connected with the idea of pol uh, polyarchy. Is it correct? Polyarchy? Polyarchy. I mean something which is connected with the idea of uh, uh, decision which are more and more connected with a horizontal network. Here we are in Pristina. It's another, it is a, uh, one of the public relations men of the military force in, in, uh, in Kosovo. And in Pristina, we have observed uh, paradoxical phenomena. So you know, the, the war has tried to, to solve an ethnical, uh, strong uh, um, segregation of the local population uh, caused by 10 years of apartheid uh, during the Milosevic um, presence in, 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 in Yugoslavia. But what happened uh, after the war was the first paradox that exactly was the, the, the Serbian uh, population that was before and during the apartheid, uh, the 20% of the local population has become the 0.2% uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the Kosovo uh, Pristina population. And so uh, it's a sort of a paradoxical, a perverse effect of the, of the war. The war was during simply one year. But the second paradoxical effect, which is incredibly strange, is that nevertheless, Pristina is nowadays in Europe maybe the most cosmopolitan city we can face. It's in sense that in Pristina we, we can, uh, uh, are in, in Pristina more than 6,000 people coming from abroad are nowadays inhabiting the city. I mean uh, militars, but uh, uh, more than militars, uh, people coming from uh, uh, non, um, oh, oh, non organization what's NGOs. NGOs, sorry. So personal coming from the uh, different uh, state, national uh, bureaucracies. Uh, but what's interesting to observe in a, in a case like this one is not simply, of course, the, the effect of these two paradoxes, which is, in a certain sense, it strains it itself. What is interesting to observe uh, is how these two cities are working together, because they are really two parallel cities. One is the city of stable residents, of stable inhabitants, is the city of Kosovo, of people with, uh, coming from Albanese uh, uh, language tradition. 
And is the city really abandoned in terms of uh, quality of public space? A city which is starting to recuperate the uh, uh, quality of, uh, of ordinary life. And the other city is a city which is formed by this circuit of uh, these uh, temporary presences made by militaries, bureaucrats, employers of NGO organization, and so on. And these two cities are really uh, one superimposed on the other, but they, in a certain sense, they never touch. They have no connection. The circuit, the recent of the, of the abroad and the temporary population is uh, working in the background of the city of, uh, re temp of a stable residence uh, without touching it. And also in this case, we are observing something which is incredibly extreme in Pristina, but that we can observe also in other European uh, situation. Because I think that, for instance, if we take care of what's happening in, in Frankfurt or in London, connected with the circuit of uh, uh, financial, um, financial networks, or what is happening in Brussels and Strasbourg with the European bureaucracy, uh, we can really observe how this model of parallel cities, something which is more and more uh, diffused in our geopolitical uh, environment. So, uh, in order to, to go to finish, I think that if we use this four character of uh, Europe, I mean, uh, cumulative capacity to accumulate things and experience and tradition, the capacity to metabolize what is usually uh, coming from abroad, uh, and to reinterpret uh, in a certain sense. Also from the point of view of uh, the history of architecture, I think this is a, a very interesting specificity of Europe. Uh, the capacity to, uh, to host uh, so high density of things and, uh, and, uh, and people, and then the capacity to, uh, to, to, to follow a model of polyarchy. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, a, a system of decision which is shared by a large number of people. So I think that these are four very, very, in a certain sense, banal uh, comments that we can do about Europe nowadays. But, but if we can work using these four characters together, and we really use them uh, when we have to, to face with conditions like this one, we start to know something more about what is nowadays Europe. And we start, we have, the, I think, the feeling that what we are observing is a device of change, is a local device of change, which is radically different from what we can meet in other parts of the world. Also is, we have to be honest, we know that Europe is not simply what is happening within the perimeter of geopolitical Europe. Europe is, we can meet Europe also in other continents. We can meet this kind of special device, this kind of urban device in other spaces, in other regions of other world. And I think that always what we meet when we uh, try to describe, this is a, a, a sat, not a satellite image, it's a, an image of Europe um, uh, composed using statistic dates, which give us the idea of uh, how Europe can be really uh, represented by uh, a unique uh, city in a certain sense. This is a map showing the network of multiplicity. And this is more or less the, uh, the sampling uh, we have done, or the, uh, the list of cases we have chosen in our, in our research. Uh, to finish with uh, use, I simply want to tell you that uh, this device of change can be also described uh, using different point of view about what's happening in the physical environment. Uh, for instance, that we can really say that always with the idea to enter uh, in the Europe as a unique city in a certain sense, uh, to enter with the idea to observe how these four characters are working nowadays in the physical environment. One thing that we can immediately observe uh, taking a certain distance from the physical environment uh, is that the uh, uh, European environment is, is uh, crossed by huge upheavals. And these upheavals are uh, uh, 
more or less uh, uh, strong and diffused. But what is interesting in these upheavals is that they are always composed by a multitude of individual tremors. Uh, you know, of course, I'm sure that you know Andrea Branzi because he has done a lecture here, and he probably is, is coming to, to give another lecture in the next weeks. But uh, Andrea Branzi has used uh, once a, a word that I really like when he's spoken about physical change. He's spoken about uh, bradyseismic steers. Uh, I like this term because it helps us to understand how the change in Europe is always, also when it's, it has a huge extension, is always composed by a multitude of individual sorts, individual tremors, individual changes. And this is one of the main uh, specificity of uh, physical European environment. Uh, this, we, here we are in Paris, this is another incredible case. It's a case of, uh, uh, let me see, a modernist uh, building built in the 70s which has been completely subverted and reused by a Chinese, new Chinese immigrant population, which has started to use the towers that were in the, in the, in the rigid layout of the building uh, planet to be used only for uh, loft and for um, flat. flat. Uh, using flats as space to, for, for workshop, for uh, temples, restaurants, and using also uh, flats as space for, for uh, productive uh, activities, which change uh, every month the floor, also for, for, for question to, to escape from the control of the police, but also in order to avoid to the noise pollution for the people who are living there. At the same time, the parking space, which are 25 meters, five, five or six floors of parking space underground, which is used like a bazaar like a really market, and the more you go uh, underground, the more you meet uh, illegal uh, commercial activities. And also the, the space on the platform, which was planned to be simply destined to commercial activities, is used in a completely different way, as a way, place for, for meetings for the different uh, families and different uh, tributes which habit, inhabit this. This city, which has decided to to, to habit, inhabit uh, uh, a, a huge building. And here we have, uh, of course, something which we know very well, because it's not uh, simply an exception in the European environment. But what is interesting, of course, is to see how, for instance, a model uh, like this one, which is a model of, uh, let me say, uh, rigid typology uh, with, a, let me say, a bad uh, version of what we usually consider the uh, modernism in uh, architecture during the 70s, can be more flexible and more able to accept new social behaviors. Uh, then, for instance, part of the historical medieval tissue of urban Europe cities. This is something I think that we have to, to observe with a big attention, because it's, it's in, a, in a certain sense suggesting us that there are spaces in our contemporary cities that we are usually we don't see or we, are, uh, we see with uh, careless, we, 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 are, we don't appreciate, but that can play an interesting role also thanks to their uh, originary rigidity. And also if it may become a paradox, which is very interesting. So uh, we started, for instance, to describe these uh, upheavals, these large bradyseistic steers, this uh, large movement we are changing uh, Europe, trying to, uh, let me say, to put together the different result of uh, the case study which we observed during the research. As you can say, but we have not time to to better. Another point of view is, uh, of course, the opposite point of view. In terms that if we don't start with a lot, with a taking distance from the physical environment, but we start entering in the physical environment. Let me say, with our body as a really uh, as a phenomenological point of view, of what is happening in the contemporary urban uh, environment, we have, of course, uh, a complete different uh, appreciation of what's happening. We have the uh, we have the direct material perception of what is uh, the notion of multitude, 
but you know very well. But at the same time, what we are observing is that in Europe, uh, in the context of Europe, uh, European cities, what is changing is uh, really connected with the principle of differentiation and the principle of variation of uh, urban environment. And this is something which is really important for me in terms also of uh, uh, design, in terms also of uh, capacity to imagine uh, non-deterministic urbanism or to imagine a role for architecture in the contemporary urban conditions. What's happened is that, uh, as we know very well, in the modern city and the historical European city, uh, the principle of uh, differentiation uh, was working, uh, specifying and uh, sharing uh, some huge parts of the city. Uh, our cities are composed, have been composed by different homogeneous parts, and within each one of these homogeneous parts, uh, we can also observe a capacity of variation. Uh, we know very well the example of uh, uh, 19th century blocks, for instance. The 19th century block is uh, something which composes a part of the city, which is different from the medieval part or for the uh, modern of the Renaissance uh, part of the city, but and within the, this environment we can observe an incredible capacity to vary the single typology of the buildings. And I think that this device is something which is also connected with Europe, is also connected with the capacity of an intermediate level to accept variation, which are individual variation, and to absorb variation in a more, uh, let me say, intermediate uh, uh, composition. Uh, what's happening in the last decades, and what is really giving us the idea that we are uh, in a phase of transition in the condition of urban environment, is that nowadays, also in Europe, when we, when we observe the parental the suburban environments, as we have seen in Benelux, or as we can say, uh, simply taking a car and going in, in Amsterdam or in Ajax, come, uh, starting from, from Rotterdam, is that uh, the principle of, uh, of differentiation is no longer working, uh, defining huge homogeneous parts, but is working at a really uh, at a molecular scale. It works distinguishing the single family house from the shopping mall, distinguishing the shopping mall from the highway, distinguishing the highway from the uh, big containers, and so on. And the principle of variation is no longer working within each one of these homogeneous huge parts, but is working, let me say, in a more abstract way. Declining typology of buildings which are in the physical environment uh, completely uh, isolated, completely not connected uh, by a, a clear syntax. So I think that this consideration may also uh, suggest us something about what we can, we can do in, uh, as architects, as our urban planners in Europe. And maybe the last one, point of view, that I really think that can be useful to tell something more about what is Europe nowadays is the concept of self-organization, I'm going to finish. Uh, not simply because self-organization is, as I've told you before, something which uh, describe as uh, the more and more uh, strong dimension of spontaneous processes of change. But I think more because self-organization is something connected uh, with the, uh, the uh, preeminence of uh, horizontal relations between uh, uh, the multitude of minorities which inhabit the European space and the European society. Uh, I think that we can uh, be careful to use the term. This is a, a very generic and in a certain sense vague term. Uh, and uh, what I think is used in the sense is, uh, is to really use the, the notion of self-organization in order to describe this network of horizontal connections. Uh, and at the same time, I think that circumnavigation is not in itself, a, a, let me say, a, an evaluation. I really, and we really don't think that the case study that we have observed here, we are observing another absolutely new case study which has been developed also in Berlage Institute, which is the case of uh, uh, techno tribes and of techno raves. Uh, you know, techno raves is a process of uh, uh, changing of 
temporary mobile events, public temporary mobile events, uh, starting from Great Britain and France, and now has invading also the Eastern Europe. And uh, you know very well how Technorave take part, so it's absolutely useless to describe it. But what's interesting is to observe the model of change of space that Technoraves um, um, suggest. Uh, also as a model, because in a certain sense, this model of a public uh, uh, space which works as a flame, uh, like a, a temporary event, is something which is coming to be more and more important. And something is unique model able to oppose itself to the uh, other uh, institutionalized model of, uh, of the, let me say, huge commercial uh, uh, containers of the sh big, huge shopping malls. So a model which is incredibly stable in terms of meanings, in terms of codes, in terms of nature, in terms of physical uh, presence. I think this is something which can really help us to, to tell something more. But what I was simply saying that for us, self-organization is not uh, in itself an evaluation of, uh, we, can, we are not uh, 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 telling that what is self-organized is in any case something which is positive, which, which is uh, going in the right direction. Absolutely not. We have also described the process of self-organization. We are really causing uh, bad effects in the social environment of our city. What we are simply underlining is that these horizontal networks are more and more important in the contemporary, uh, in contemporary Europe and more and more able to determine the uncertainty of public policies in Europe. Because in a certain sense, the cases we have observed are cases in which the collective effects have been produced uh, in absence of the public authority. So really, we have to start to, 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 to observe how one of the characters of, Europea, of Europe, of urban Europe nowadays, exactly this character to, to let me say, to produce uh, 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 unpredictable, uncertain uh, condition in the evolution of urban space. OK. Uh, OK, simply one last thing. It's connected with, a, a, let me say, a tragic uh, invisible event which happened in um, in uh, Italy, uh, in, uh, in December 96, so four year, f five years ago, uh, maybe you have read something about this. Uh, in a certain sense, it's always something connected with the concept of stratification. Uh, in December 26, 1996, a, a, a ghost ship a ghost ship uh, uh, with uh, 283 Singalese, Singalese sing, uh, uh, clandestine immigrants on board uh, um, on routes from Malta towards uh, um, the south of uh, Italy, uh, sunk carrying with it uh, uh, its uh, load of, uh, of life. Um, Mm, a few miles off from the south uh, eastern Sicily, and for five years, five years, for two thousand days, for sixty months, the Italian authorities refused to consider the invocation of the families of the people died in the uh, in the shipwreck, saying that the shipwreck was not uh, true, was simply a fake. And uh, this happened also uh, uh, in the same in, in, in during these months, during these weeks, during these days, the fishermen of Sicily coast uh, more and more found uh, corpses in their nets. So what's happening in these five years was the, this ghost ship disappeared, uh, but at the same time the, uh, the, the effects of this uh, disappearance was incredibly visible in the ordinary life of thousands of people, but the political institution in Italy were able to, uh, let me say, deny it, to absolutely don't take care, don't accept a, a something which was so visible, uh, so evident. And only, only some uh, months ago, uh, a fisherman 
uh, this, this, um, found found in, in the net uh, in the net in the fish net uh, uh, an ID of a Singhalese young uh, uh, man, and this opened the a new event. The policemen started to to accept the invocation of this. Uh, thousands of people, and they, uh, in a certain sense, they, they financed a research, and this, this ghost ship was uh, emerging last uh, July from the profound sea of the Mediterranean. Uh, we are really starting to work about this case now, as a multiplicity groups, and we are trying to start from this case to develop a proposal for the next Documenta Castle exposition, which will take, care, take place in the, in the next uh, June in, in, in Castle. But what we are doing here, we are really trying to observe something which is a little bit different from uh, the same uh, uh, geographic uh, field that we observed uh, in the, with the research about uh, Europe. What we are observing is uh, more or less the Mediterranean basin, so the Mediterranean Sea, with the idea that Mediterranean is no longer the basin of uh, multicultural exchanges. It's no longer the place where different traditions can uh, mix themselves. It's no longer a melting pot, a, a, a meeting point for uh, culture and, uh, and different population. I think this is a completely hypocrite point of view, what is really Mediterranean nowadays. In a, in a phase of our history in which the geographical parts of Europe or sort of North Africa are more and more uh, uncertain and more and more difficult to define their perimeters, Mediterranean is coming to be probably the more rigid, the more strong, the more uh, mono, uh, homogeneous part of this part of the world. Uh, and exactly the idea that we are starting to develop is the idea of this sea, this part of the sea, as a sort of, uh, let me say, a solid sea. A solid sea which is crossed by a thousand of routes and which is really a rigid barrier, a rigid border, something which is coming to be, I have to say, after September 11th, more and more, something which is really geographically uh, defined part, different parts of the world. And what is in, incredibly interesting in observing this uh, part of solid sea is it, it is really uh, crossed by different routes at different level and uh, crossed by population that uh, cannot change their identity when they enter in this solid sea. The solid sea is really the sphere where you are obliged to maintain your institutional identity. If you are a military, you are a military. If you are an immigrant, you are an immigrant. If you are a fisherman, you are a fisherman. So in a, in a condition of, you, of our world, of this part of the world, where the notion of identity and the notion of uh, political and geopolitical identity of the different countries is going to be more and more hybrid, more and more open to changes, Mediterranean Sea and in general this basin is coming to be something which is obliged us to maintain an absolutely rigid notion of identity. I think that this is simply a starting point and I really like if it could be possible to work together about this, 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 uh, this theme. We are really uh, starting now. Uh, the idea is to develop in different parts of uh, this basin uh, research and uh, let me say case studies as we have seen in the uh, case of our use research to collect that and to present them in, in Castle in next June. And this is, a, I think, the, the, the way that I prefer to finish the lecture. Thank you very much. Oh, God, so good. That's been out. So, um, Benny, could I have some? Yeah. Um, if there is any comment or question or somebody who would like to perhaps uh, continue the debate. Uh, I have a little question, Stefan. Yeah. 
if you would have a group of 10 American young architects and 10 Japanese young architects, which would never visited Europe, they want to see something good, where you would send them? <laughs> oh, this, uh, I, I think that uh, I can answer in this way. I think that more and more nowadays, this model of space, this bed organized, congestion it, uh, often uh, sailed, I speak more of South Europe than North Europe, but in any case, this model, this uh, not good functioning, but this model of space is coming to be a sort of unintentional model in our, in our times. Uh, because in any case, it's uh, here we are. Sorry, we I continue the description. Here we are in Mazzara del Valle, in the south of Sicily, close nearby the where we have seen the the ship the shipwreck uh, that I have described before. And we we see here an incredible phenomenon of exchange. So it's a community of uh, uh, North African inhabitants who started to inhabit in Sicily, and a community of uh, Sicilian fishermen who started to inhabit in uh, North Africa, and they have a intense exchange of uh, goods, uh, marriages, so it's, but uh, what I want to say is that this, uh, let me say, meticcio, uh, meticcio si dice, che un nome porca, I forgot the English name today, meticcio, meticcio, who can help me? Meticcio, 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 eh? No, no, mix it, not, uh, not, uh, not right. It's, oh, I know it. OK, but mix. Mixed uh, urban environment uh, is, in any case, something which uh, always uh, is pushed to show the conflicts, to put in evidence the uh, contradictions. So it's something which hosts wars, local wars, which host uh, uh, radical and strong and tragic uh, events, but always, in a certain sense, trying to 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 to, to visit to, to end it visible. I think that what I can say is good nowadays in Europe is uh, this nature of uh, our urban uh, environment. Uh, in a certain sense, there is something from, from the aesthetic point of view that I'd like to to, to describe, but. Uh, I think that this idea of Europe as a sort of unintentional model after September 11th is something that we have to, to, to consider with more and more attention. Yes, please. Could you speak loud? No, I'm, 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 I'm about to ask you about um, the part where you were talking about uh, understanding about complexity and trying to uh, develop a strategy. Um, I'm wondering what the role of the architect can be in this condition, and uh, which what's your what's actually your um, strategy in, uh, in developing uh, in reading the DNA of this uh, complexity, and also I'm wondering that's partially connected is in this sea uh, that you're proposing the solid sea are there parts where you would say that they are also uh, <coughs> liquidish, and would you um, yeah. Being able to say that basically this principle of saying that there's solid and uh, liquid. fluid or gassy, uh, that that could be a self-similar principle that you could trace that could be sorry yeah. a self-similar principle that you could trace down into the very small scale of a decision to buy a chewing gum or something. The last word is <laughs> okay. No, but I think the first part of your question was really interesting. Also because it's uh, something that I'm not able to answer. So uh, frequent uh, answers are more and more connected with the idea of the, what will happen in your professional activity as an architect uh, doing this kind of research. And it, I think it's something which is absolutely uh, shared by, I think, most of the people which is here. Because we are all, in a certain sense, architects, but we are all because we are here in a certain sense interested in uh, developing this kind of, uh, let me say, inclusive research about urban condition. Uh, 
I have no answer. And really, I think that uh, uh, to do this kind of research is a good condition for, for, for architecture, but it's not a guarantee for doing good architecture. I absolutely think that it's not, it is not uh, a guarantee. I think it can create a good uh, background. It can uh, ups, help us to be more sensitive and uh, nothing more. So, for instance, I, I really prefer uh, to distinguish uh, what I'm doing as an architect when I do research and what I'm doing as an architect when I'm deliberating and proposing my design and my projects. Also because, that's for me incredibly important, I think that our role I told you before this, we are so close to the physical change and the change in physical environment is so incredibly interesting and useful to describe what is, camp is changing in the social environment in these in this times. But I think that we have the responsibility as architects and to describe, to uh, let emerge these processes. We are really maybe uh, the witnesses the more uh, interesting and uh, more uh, legitimate witnesses of this change nowadays. But this is not necessarily connected with architecture in terms of uh, uh, design activity. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And also, I, I have to tell you more, the result of this kind of research, the result of the research that you are doing of urban condition, has, uh, they, I really think they, they have not to be synthesized and assumed in uh, the architectural practices. Why? Absolutely, I think this is also another, another rhetoric we have hosted in how our recent uh, history has a uh, weak discipline. Yeah, so, uh, it's a question about the hardware and the software, because in some hardware, uh, the way how you described uh, the very unpredictable uh, changes is a change in the software and the use uh, of, uh, of spaces. So, there's always a question I wonder about is the reason of these changes is actually a lot faster than the reason of changes of the hardware. So how can we actually implement this in terms of... Uh, no, I think it's not true. I, I, I understand what you're saying and uh, uh, I think it's not true in, in terms because, uh, for instance, some of the cases we have showed it's, are cases of uh, uh, huge physical change. So really physical change more than uh, uh, so in, in which the hardware is uh, really radically involved in the process of mutation. Um, if, okay, but there are several things to say, but this is a, a question. I think that, for instance, if we if we uh, if we take care of how, for instance, the 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 virtual and material networks are working nowadays in Europe, uh, we can learn something about this relation between hardware and software. Because for instance, in Europe, networks are always something which is uh, condemned to be reused. Uh, when we say network, we say nodes, uh, we say uh, fluxus, and we say also network in terms of uh, infrastructures. Uh, not in, and Europe is really the place where we can find the experience of, uh, of uh, reuse and, uh, in a certain sense, uh, parasite reuse of the same uh, material parts of these immaterial networks, for instance. So there is something in Europe of characteristic or specific also from this, also from this point of view, that is, could be interesting to develop for me. Uh, uh, we can have uh, several examples, very new, uh, starting from the idea of containers, which host not simply goods but also immigrants, to the uh, to the to the consideration of uh, the role that uh, railway station has in the in the field of contemporary urban cities in Europe, like public, uh, uh, cons like really uh, public place, uh, very complex public space, but they are always connected with material network, but at the same time incredibly um, radicated and incredibly uh, growth in the physical local environment. So, but it's not an answer, sorry. I think it's, it's a good question to start with a new lecture, maybe not by me. <laughs>
Stefano, thanks a lot. Thank you. And, uh, uh, I was a bit, I was trying to, to yeah, call. Yeah, thinking of <laughs> I, I try, I will be difficult. Okay. But please, let's yeah. go to No, I just want to thank you for, for this uh, uh, lecture and looking forward uh, for your uh, next uh, research exercise. But this was supposed to be a part of the lecture, but uh, maybe... Uh, yeah, it has to be, I forgot. Story, he's already gone, but... Uh, I forgot. Shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, because in Paris, uh, Hans Ulrich Orbis is inaugurating, is opening tonight uh, uh, an exposition about the notion of crossing, which is really interesting for... Uh, <laughs> Okay, next time. Stefano, thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll try another minute. Nevertheless, you should give him a call.